The Lord is always working. But the devil is always working. The Lord wants us to stay focused on doing what he wants us to do, and that is partnering with him. The devil wants us to be distracted with extremes. He likes to push us to different extremes. While Jesus stays, stayed focused on what the Father had for him, everyone else was getting tossed to and fro. All of his disciples. You guys remember the story, right? And it's no different now. How many of you ever heard someone say something like this? Why do they talk about demons all the time? They shouldn't talk about demons too much. Why don't we just focus on what God is doing? It's always a bigger, better thing that God is doing. God is always working. The devil is always working. Should we ignore either? No. Paul, in fact, says we should not be ignorant of the devil's schemes. In this season of the devil, Halloween, while other churches partner with the devil by entertaining themselves, host trunk or treat events, and invite demons into their midst, we at Spirit and Truth are coming against the enemy because the enemy is coming against us. We have had multiple miraculous healings and deliverances from demons over the past few months here. And that is us coming against the devil. But he is coming against us. I know that many of you here today and those not here today are experiencing the devil's attack against your family, your friends, to get at you. That is what he's doing right now. Whether it's in the form of sickness, strife, jealousy, whatever the case might be, he is working to push back against what we are doing. And any time God is doing something and the devil's also doing something, we have some options, we have some choices to make. Option A, like most American churches, we can remain ignorant of what the enemy is doing. And when we remain ignorant willfully about the enemy and what he is doing, do you know what ends up happening by default? We end up partnering with the devil. When we remain ignorant, we partner with him unknowingly. We come into agreement with him unknowingly. Option B, we can just give up. How many of you have ever felt like giving up when times are hard? Yeah, if, if you haven't, you're not human. Okay, let's get real. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that is because the devil is always working. And he doesn't care if you're discouraged or been knocked down. He likes to kick you when you're down. He doesn't play fair. Option C, we can actually fight back. We can encourage ourselves, amen. We can encourage ourselves in the Lord, not ignoring what the devil is doing, but not being fixated on it either. As we remember that we're seated in heavenly places. And he is not oppressing us over our head. He is actually under our feet. Amen. So every Wednesday at 6 a.m., We get to offer and bring a sacrifice of praise early in the morning when we're tired. And we have been doing that. And it's been pushing back the kingdom of darkness. And so we are fighting back and we will continue to fight back. And if you would like to join us when we gather together to push back the kingdom of darkness in this season of darkness, I invite you to come every Wednesday at 6 a.m. What we're going to be looking at today is very timely and appropriate. 
It just so happens, quote unquote, to be Halloween when the devil is rampant and working overtime. And I would believe and state more than even last year this time. And how interesting that we just happen to find ourselves as we're chronologically going through the book of Mark in a passage where Jesus is talking about coming against the devil. As those who didn't see the reality of the devil were coming against him. So that's what we're going to look at today in Mark chapter 3. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week with a little bit of overlap. In Mark chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Then he, Jesus, went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, when who heard it? His family. When Jesus' family heard it, heard what? What does it say? When they heard that a crowd was gathering again. What did his family do when they heard a crowd was gathering to Jesus again? It says, so they could not even eat. It was that busy. It was that crowded. Verse 21, and when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, to stop him, a.k.a., for they were saying he is out of his mind. Notice that their words were paired with their actions. They brought words of death as they tried to physically, with their actions, stop him. His family, they say, he is out of his mind. Was Jesus out of his mind? No. Why did his family say and accuse Jesus of being out of his mind? What was driving them to say that? Because there was a crowd. Because they were jealous. The spirit of jealousy is one and the same with the spirit of murder. When you are jealous against someone, you have a murderous spirit against them. Whether or not you ever murder them with your hands, what happens when we have a jealous heart is we murder people with our mouth, with our words. And this is what Jesus' family was doing. And jealousy most often manifests, jealousy most often manifests among those who are closest to us specifically our family. And it's been that way from the beginning. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Notice the wording of what Abel brought to the Lord. It doesn't say the leftovers. It says he brought the firstborn, the first fruits, basically, of his flock and their fat portions. He brought the very best he had to the Lord and sacrificed it, which cost financially for, for Abel. Okay, that was provision for, for him, for his family. Or he could have traded it, right, at that time. It meant money. It meant sacrifice. And Abel brought a sacrifice that meant something, that cost him something. And Cain, it doesn't say much about his sacrifice. Um, but it doesn't say it was, it was something that was pleasing to the Lord. Because we go on, and it says in verse 5, But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Why was Jesus' family angry? Is it because Jesus did something to make them angry? He had wronged them somehow? 
Had Jesus sinned against his family when they were angry and said he's crazy and they tried to seize him? No. What was happening? They were stirred up with the spirit of jealousy. Okay? Why did Cain get angry at his brother? Has it, had his brother Abel done anything against him? Nothing at all. He simply looked with his eyes and saw how his brother Abel offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And instead of Cain saying, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and offer a good sacrifice to the Lord also. Right? That's option A. I could, he could have said, I'm going to offer a costly sacrifice. I'm going to look at my brother's example of what worship looks like. And I'm going to do the same. That was what Cain could have done. And the Lord even warned him. Jesus, or The Lord says, To Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? A.K.A., what, what reason do you have to be angry? What legitimate reason? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is contrary to you or, or to take you. But you must rule over it. So the Lord graciously comes and he notices the countenance on Cain's face and sees that he's jealous. He's angry. He has a murderous spirit that's manifesting in him. And the Lord warns him. He says, if you've done good, if you've offered a good sacrifice, then your countenance will be good. Your face will, you will have a smile on your face, (laughs) right? But if you haven't and you're bummed out and you're sad, it's because you have done wrong, not your brother. So Cain's angry at his brother for what he has done. So he's shifting the blame, okay? He's creating a smoke screen for his own sin, to cover his own sin instead of repenting of his sin and changing. And that is how jealousy operates. People look at you, look at anyone who says, I am a genuine worshiper of God. They will look at you and they will get jealous. Instead of just going and getting their own oil, they're jealous of your oil. Do you see what I'm saying? This is how jealousy operates. Verse 8 Notice verse 8 in Genesis chapter 4. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. It does not say what he said, but I guarantee you that whatever Cain spoke to his brother were words of death and anger. Because we look at his actions, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. This is the spirit, this is where the spirit of jealousy first manifested on the earth. Satan actually invented jealousy when he wanted to ascend above God. And so he brought it down to the earth. Eve took the bait, right? God's withholding something from you, Eve. Right? That same spirit of of like, I want more, I don't have enough. And discontentment is all mixed in with it. And so this same spirit is manifesting in Jesus' very own family members as they try to come and seize him. And what are they doing? They are saying he is out of his mind or he's crazy, right? Even though he's not crazy, why are they doing that? Because they were not doing what Jesus was doing, which was the right thing to do. And instead of joining Jesus to do what? Cast out demons. This is what, what's happening here. Because of Jesus setting so many people free, people were elated with joy. And so they followed him because Jesus had set them free. So they followed him because of what he had done for them. They loved him. They, they followed him. They wanted more of, of, of God's presence. They didn't even know what it was probably, right? And so the devil comes to his family, those closest to him, to to stir up the spirit of jealousy that he's been operating in the the devil from the very beginning, right? And the devil will come to anyone who will work with him. And that's what he's doing here in Jesus' family. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words can bring life, they can create life. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So when we, when we speak life, 
to people, we create life. When we speak encouragement, we're creating encouragement. Do you guys see what I'm saying? But we can use our words to kill. Jealousy is one and the same with the spirit of murder. And it's... Words are like javelins. Words are like spears, fiery darts thrown at people if they are used and operated in in a spirit of jealousy. Whether to their face or behind the scenes, words are like javelins. It reminds me of a story in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6. It says, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistines, speaking of Goliath, the women came out, all, out, out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very, what? Angry at this, and this saying displeased him. What just happened with Saul in the story? A spirit of jealousy entered. Why? Because David was getting more praise than he was. Had David done anything wrong? Absolutely not. In fact, David was helping Saul's kingdom. He killed, a, he killed Goliath. He had actually went on to win many, many battles against the Philistines for Saul to help him. In, in, a, in a spirit of humility. And Saul even sent David to war, to battle sometimes, so that David would be killed. And David came back, it backfired on that spirit of jealousy. David came back winning a, a huge battle, time and time again. And so Saul became more and more angry. And even in the next chapter, um, we see in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 8, and there, were, and there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow, so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul, so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night." And I didn't keep reading it, but earlier in, this, in the previous chapter, in chapter 18, it says, um, if you keep reading, um, the second part of verse 8, it says, He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousand, Saul saying this, and me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? He's being like extreme, like David's going to take the kingdom from me, which is not reality. And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. And he did this day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. That is what the spirit of jealousy does. And as I mentioned last week, Jesus' family may have thought that what they were saying and what they were doing out of that spirit was, was innocent. They thought maybe it didn't, wasn't even going to have an impact, but it actually kicked off a greater persecution. If you look and keep reading in Mark chapter 3, verse 22, it says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem. Why were the scribes coming down from Jerusalem? Were they, were they coming down to, well, I want to ask this question, were they coming down to follow Jesus, to hear his words? <laughs> no, this, this similar phrase is repeated throughout the book of Acts. Anytime there's revival, revival there's freedom from demons, there's miraculous healings, guess what happens? The, uh, the leaders, the religious leaders, would come down from Jerusalem to that place to shut the thing down, to come against what was happening. 
These are the first century pastors that came against what God was doing through his followers to set people free from demons. And it, notice what it says in verse 22. They were saying, again, there it is, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Man, the devil knows that words kill. I think the church forgets sometimes that words bring life and that they can kill. But the devil knows it. And so he brings these Pharisees, these first century, basically pastors, church leaders, down from Jerusalem saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub and by the prince of demons. He casts out demons. Again, why are they doing this? Is it because Jesus had wronged them? No. It's a smoke screen. The devil was trying to shift the blame and cause it to create a distraction away from what? Away from what? The devil does not want people to get free from his grasp. He's trying to stop it. There was so much freedom happening for people that he sent those who had the most authority <laughs> to come in, in that culture to come stop what was happening. So, who was at work in the first century pastors if they were coming and resisting and trying to stop Jesus from casting out the devil? Satan. First century leaders were in league with the devil, otherwise they would have not resisted people getting free from the devil. Okay? We always, you have to look at not what people say so much as what they do as well. Someone, if someone says, well, I'm all about that, but then they never do it, if they say, oh, I'm okay with casting out demons, then I would, I would retort back, have you ever cast demons out yourself? Do you care about people enough to set people free from the demonic, like Jesus did? That would be my question. So Satan's strategy here was to distract and deflect attention away from where the enemy was operating in the, in the leaders, the religious leaders. Do you see that? He's trying to deflect. He's trying to stop what Jesus was doing at this time. Satan didn't like what Jesus was doing. In most cities in America, if you are part of a church that even talks about casting out demons, much less does it, you will be branded crazy. You will be ostracized. You will be talked about. You will be, quote unquote, killed with others' words. You will be cursed. You will have javelins thrown at you. Why? Because as they say, don't talk too much about the devil. In other words, the devil's saying through them, nothing to see here. Yeah. And if the devil's coming against churches that do cast out demons, what does that mean? Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That means we're in alignment with Jesus. Right. If the devil is coming against any church and trying to stop them from casting out demons through even other church bodies and church leaders. What does that mean? You guys can put the pieces together. <laughs> I don't know how many people have, have made comments like this throughout my, my time, my 40 plus years of being a Christian in the church. Avoid the topic. Don't talk about the devil. I'm like, why? Why would you not want to be educated about what's happening to us all every single day. Yeah. yeah, Paul literally says we are not ignorant of his schemes, and yet so many are ignorant of his schemes. It's anti-biblical. You know what? I will, I will make another statement that is biblical here. Any Christian, specifically leaders, anybody, who comes against and chides and backbites against any other group of believers who cast out devils, they are antichrist. Yeah, that's right. 
And to not cast out the devil when it's needed, right, right. is what? It's to enable him yeah. to operate anywhere and everywhere. If you do not tell him to, the devil to not do something, he will do it. He doesn't need permission. <laughs> but we do have authority to push back the evil one. Jesus is on earth trying to bring the kingdom, right? He's doing what the Father has asked him to do. But he keeps encountering this. So what's, what's he to do? Look the other way. It's inevitable. When you bring the true presence of God in the true kingdom of heaven, you will encounter the devil. And if you're not bringing the kingdom, the devil's going to leave you alone, and there probably won't be demonic manifestations. That's just the truth of it. So what was Jesus' response to all of this anti-Jesus nonsense? that is still prevalent in 21st century American churches. How did Jesus respond to that sort of resistance? In verse 23, And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. In other words, Jesus is, is basically exposing the devil here and his lies and his deception. So anytime you hear, let me just bring this full circle. Anytime you hear someone, specifically a Christian, because I haven't heard non-believers come against casting out demons. I've never heard that. It's only Christians, ironically. Um, anytime you have a, a Christian come to you and say, you know what, you, you're talking too much about devils, you shouldn't be doing all that stuff, and they get or they manifest and just quickly change the subject. Okay? Anytime that's happening... They're using essentially the same argument that the Pharisees did. They're basically saying, you're doing what's evil. Don't do that. Don't touch that. Don't go there. Just let people stay in their demonic chains. Leave them alone. Let's not go there. Let's be comfortable, right, in our Lexuses and our houses. And let's just do our own thing in our little American bubble. Let's not help anybody get free. Let's not get messy. That's what the devil wants, though. Isn't that what the devil wants? Yeah, exactly. If the devil wants that, I say I don't want to give him what he wants. That's right. Come on. I don't want to give him any more captives. He has enough captives. Yeah. He's taken enough people to hell. Yeah. That's what I say. So next time someone says that to you, or Christians can't be influenced by the devil, oh, yeah. Yeah. the devil's not going to bother you because you're saved. <laughs> Was Jesus, quote unquote, saved? Did the devil bother him? Come on. Who did Paul write Ephesians chapter 6 to when he said, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day? Who was he writing to? Unbelievers? Christians. He was writing to Christians. That was his audience. That's who battles against the devil, Christians, because the devil knows that if he can shut down believers from setting captives free, he can send more people to hell with him. We're the only ones who have the authority over the devil, right, in America, in the world. Christians who have been given the authority by Jesus himself to do these things. Amen. So this is how Jesus responded. This is, his, his, this is heavenly divine wisdom from the, this is as good as it gets, guys. This is how Jesus responds. He says, how can Satan cast out Satan? Like, we're crazy for doing that devil stuff, casting out demons. Wait a minute. Why would we come against Satan if we're satanic? Come on, guys. Let, let's be logical here, right? That's the argument Jesus is, is retorting back to with uh, these leaders with. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he's getting more specific. He's like, if you don't understand my parable, I'm getting more and more like, I'm going to spell it out for you as he moves on. He cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, 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 he may plunder his house. Yeah. Amen. What is he referring to here? 
So he shifts from sharing this parable about, uh, it's illo- he's basically saying it's illogical what you guys are saying, that I'm casting out demons by the father of demons. That's crazy. He moves on from that and shuts that down very well to, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods. So he debunks this theory that, that somehow casting out demons is demonic. And then he moves on to say, you, but you can't go in and plunder a strong man's house unless you first bind him. In other words, you can't just go in and try to set people free unless you bind up the devil, right? right. You, have to, you actually have to do something. Because these are people who have been captives of the devil already for a long time. He's not going to just willingly hand them over to you. It's going to take a fight. It's going to take us doing something, not sitting and doing nothing. This is the mandate of every single, 100% of every Christian that has ever called the name Christ. This is the mandate to cast out demons. Amen. Yeah, that's right. This is the basic mandate. This is, this is so foundational because Jesus did it all the time, wherever he went. Amen. And yet this is very, very infrequently happening. Well put. The body of Christ doesn't have the confidence and to even do this. It's a very good point, Brett. And I was actually just thinking about along those lines when you said it. So, so let's talk about that for a minute. So I think what happens eventually is when anytime we talk about this topic in most church settings, people just go, I don't know what to do next. I know I'm supposed to do this, but I don't know how. Like, I don't know what to do. Um, and so coming soon, I'm just going to give you guys a, a, an update on a coming attraction. <laughs> coming soon, we are going to be having spiritual warfare training. And it's not just going to be for spirit and truth. It's going to be for any spiritual warfare, uh, spiritual warrior, who's anyone who wants to become a spiritual war- warrior in this area. Amen. I don't know when it's coming, but this has been on my heart for years now. And I've been waiting for the right time. And I don't even know when the right time is yet. But I know, and I will prophesy 100% that it is coming. Amen. Okay? And so... I actually was speaking to a local pastor and I asked this question. I said, why is it that more churches aren't doing this? And he said to me, it's a local pastor at a church that does not do deliverance at all. He said to me, he goes, we just don't know how. (laughs) And so when people feel inadequate, they want to switch, change the subject because they don't know what you're talking about and they feel small. You do what I'm saying, guys? And that shouldn't be. Because why? The devil has blinded their eyes. The devil is always working. But the Lord is always working as well. So this is an opportunity that we have in this season, I believe, to invite those who want to learn about how to resist the devil and keep our eyes on Jesus in the process. It's an opportunity to bring training and learning. And it's not just going to be like book work training, where we, where we gather up a bunch of quote-unquote scholars about a topic and we take notes and go chapter by chapter and sit down at desks. That's not the kind of training that Jesus offered to his disciples. He didn't say sit down at a desk and get a degree on spiritual warfare. He said, let's just go do some spiritual warfare and you'll learn how to do it in the process. And if you manifest disciples, I'll deal with that when it comes up. Because helping others get free means you need to get free too, right? You can't be a warrior if you've got a bunch of shrapnel in your body. But we can't sit around and wait and say, you know what, I need to be healed first before I can be a warrior. No, 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 the healing comes in the going. God's not waiting for perfect people. He's waiting for obedient people. He's looking for people that, that aren't just going to say, you know what, I'm going be- to listen to the devil, the devil who tells me, you're not good enough yet. 
You need more time. Just sit around and do nothing while people go to hell, right? But the Lord says, you know what? I work with fishermen, Peter and James and John. I work with people who know nothing. Those are my prime candidates, he says. So when the devil says, you know what? Just shut your brain off and don't, and shut, close up your ears when this man's talking about spiritual warfare and casting out demons. That's the devil talking, by the way. Or I don't really care about that stuff. It's not relevant to me. That's the devil talking. Or that's too big. I don't know what to do with it. That's the devil talking. Because Jesus works with people, myself included, who come poor and weak and say, I need help and I don't know what I'm doing. And he says, no problemo. I do know what I'm doing, he says. Right? It's this partnership. And am I going to know everything? Are you going to know everything on day one? Absolutely not. But if we can be humble enough to say, man, I don't know everything, but I'm willing to learn, he will teach us. He will teach us. And that's what's going to bring revival. The, the revival that we've all been longing for, at least I would hope that we're all longing for, I know I've been longing for it for a long time, will not happen. A revival of the kingdom of heaven will not happen until the devil is dealt with. It just, it won't. If he's enthroned on the streets and in the marketplace and in the churches and in our homes, if the devil's enthroned in those places, there won't be a revival. All it takes is humility and saying, I need your help, Lord, to be bold and open my mouth to speak the words of life. Not to be humble and have this false humility where I sit in my home and do nothing. That's devil humility. Godly humility is obedience. Pride is resisting the the Lord when he says, this is what I want you to do. That's humility. Humility is doing and obeying and saying and speaking. You hear what I'm saying? Humility is not being quiet and saying, woe is me, I'm going to bow my head down. Humility is lifting your head high and taking the devil head on like Jesus did. Was Jesus humble? Look what he did. Look the kind of stuff he did. He was never prideful in one moment of his life. And yet he did some very bold things and he said some very bold things. The devil has... deceived us. So this is, this is why Jesus said what he said. He said, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods. Now, when he says goods, what's he talking about? He's talking, it's a, it's a, it's a metaphor, it's a parable, plunder his goods. In other words, take souls away from the devil and transfer them into the kingdom of light. Plunder. Do you want to plunder what the devil has stolen from the Father of lights? If you want to plunder, if you want to steal from the devil as he has stolen from you, it requires some tenacity. It requires some seriousness. It requires some commitment in your heart to say, you know what, no matter how many times I get knocked down, no matter how many times I fail and I stumble, I will not give in. I will keep getting up. That's what happens in battle. You fall down. You get, you get bullets that graze past you, that take out your leg from time to time. But what do you do? Just lay there and let gangrene set in? Or do something about it, right? Right? So that's what the devil is doing. He's trying to shut Jesus down here, and it didn't work. Because Jesus fought back with his words and continually with his actions. Does that make sense, guys? So he says here, he says, you have to bind the strong man, the strong man's house. Guys, Jesus is invading the strong man's house. Do you know who he's talking to? He's responding to a first century pastor. That's who brought the question up. And he's also responding to his family members that don't like his popularity. They don't like that he's setting people. They could care less that Jesus was setting people free. They just didn't like that he had crowds. Taking the earth for the kingdom of heaven requires 
taking away the kingdom of darkness. It requires an invasion. Invasion, everything about that word means battle. It's not easy. It's not fun. It requires awareness. It requires discernment. It requires a constant filling and refilling of the Holy Spirit. It requires brothers and sisters. You can't do it on your own. Yeah, what, what, what army? There's no such thing as an army of one. No such thing. Right? So, so he says we have to, to, in other words, to invade the strong man's house, we have to bind him. In order to take souls from the devil, we have to bind the devil. It says, unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? He is saying to these first century leaders, to his family members, he is saying to them, this has to be done. It is an absolute essential necessity in order to invade the kingdom of darkness and bring the kingdom of heaven on earth the strong man, the devil, has to be bound. Yeah. We have to cast out demons, period. We have to engage in spiritual warfare, period. It has to happen. If it's not happening, we're just wasting our time. Yeah. We, are, we are engaging in divination. We are just speaking religious words, but not actually accomplishing anything. It might look good, but nothing's actually changing. And this is what's been happening, in the, especially the last few months at Spirit and Truth. Lives have been changing. And people go away and they get hit by the devil throughout the week. They get attacked because the devil does not want them to keep that freedom or to bring that same freedom to other people. He's been coming against this house heavily because we are coming against him heavily. People, you've heard the testimonies, people are getting healed Again and again and again. Miraculous healings keep happening. And so he's coming against us with what? Sickness. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> We're going to come against him. We're going to keep declaring that healing will happen. And not just the ones that have happened, but we're going to continue to see healing. We are going to continue to see people get set free from the devil. We are going to see, see people come out of darkness and into his marvelous light and come from the kingdom of darkness on their way to hell to going to heaven and actually taking it back to the devil. We're going to see people coming out of witchcraft. We're going to see people coming out of dead religion and being leaders in the church. That's what we're going to see. And how do you, a little side note, how do, you, how do we bind the strong man? With your words. <laughs> how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, have ever helped someone get free from at least one demon? You have to bind him. You have to bind those demons. I bind you in Jesus' name, and I remove you. Leave. Now, if those devils have legal authority to stay there in that person's life, a.k.a. that individual has engaged in sinful behavior and partnered with the devil, they need to repent of that. They need to confess that so that they can break an agreement that they've made with the devil, okay? And inviting him into their life. But at that, at that point, the devil has lost... <laughs> He has lost an agreement. But what happens with most people, most Christians, is they'll repent and say, I'm sorry, Lord, will you forgive me? And he forgives them. But they let the devil stay. And so those demons come and they tempt that person to do the same thing that they fell into in the first place. The strong man doesn't get bound. So they might get freedom for a little bit and go, oh, I experienced God's presence. And they did. But the devil doesn't get removed. It's like we do, we do all the right steps, but we miss the last one. Right? It's like, let's invite the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. But let's, should we also kick out the devil too in the process? Yeah. And then let's invite the Lord again, even more. And then guess what? We're going to have to do probably tomorrow the same thing <laughs> again. Right? Repent, cast out the devil, invite the Lord's presence. Right? And then do it again. <laughs> right? This is, this is what you, this is, called a battle. It's never going to stop while we, while we live on this earth. Jesus says this. And then he says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. 
for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. What is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Now, growing up, I heard that phraseology thrown around, but I never knew what it was. No one ever talked about it because I don't think people knew or even know what that is. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is exactly what we are talking about today. Saying that casting out the devil, bringing deliverance from demons, casting out demons is a bad thing to do. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's a, it's basically assigning something that's saying doing something good is actually evil. Does that make sense? That is an unforgivable sin. Do you see why I'm getting so worked up today, guys? This is a serious subject. So this, is, this topic of casting out demons is resisted in most churches in America, saying leaders saying that this is evil to do. It's bad. Avoid it. Don't do it. Don't cast out demons. And they don't talk about the topic. Now, I don't know people's hearts, but Jesus says that when someone does that, it is an unpardonable sin. They have damned themselves to hell because what they're doing is they are, they are basically saying what is good is evil, which is what the devil does. This is what Cain was doing. He was saying, you know what? I'm angry against my brother for what? For what I have done. <laughs> He's blaming his brother for what he did, what he didn't do. Saul, same thing. Why didn't Saul... Why didn't Saul, why wasn't Saul happy that David did what he did? He should have rejoiced with him. So that's the why. Again, we're not really talking too much about the how, but the why it's important that we should take the devil head on when we're facing something, someone with devils, with demons. It's because people need freedom. People deal with hurt. Everyone has had difficulty and pain and broken relationships. And everyone has sinned. And all these things are, are cracks or openings to demons. I was talking with someone recently and they said, D don't demons just come to people who had like serious trauma as a child? I was like, no, no. I'm like thinking Jesus had demons come to him and he didn't deal with serious trauma. So... So again, the devil has completely like spun this narrative. Like it's so extreme beyond. I will just say the devil's done an amazing job. He gets an A plus for deceiving the church on this topic. So let's not be in denial. He's done a great job. Because what most believers say is what these scribes were saying against Jesus about this topic. So he's done a great job. And we don't even know like what's happening so he says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has forget, uh, has, never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So again, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? To call something that's good as evil, right? A.K. specifically, specifically, and only actually, coming against and resisting anybody who tries to set people free from demons. Okay? That's what they did to Jesus. Yep. That's what he said. Left and right. I mean, in this, in this example just before, that's what they, the whole thing they brought up was, you're Satan casting out yeah. the devil. So exactly. This confirmation, that was really cool. And then the story continues on. His, his, um, so, so his family, <clears throat> they tried to stop Jesus. Um. We see actually a few instances of this in, in the other Gospels, in John as well. <clears throat> in fact, I think it's in, I don't know where it is in John, but Jesus' brothers, and I think maybe his, one of his sisters, come to him and they say, you should go up to the feast if you want to make yourself known. In other words, if you want to be popular, which he wasn't, but they're just like totally tongue-in-cheek. If you want to really be popular and be known, Jesus, why don't you go up to the festival and make yourself known? They knew that the Pharisees were seeking to kill Jesus spirit of jealousy. They wanted Jesus to go up to the temple so that he would be killed. They wanted him offed. They wanted him dead. Jesus' family wanted him dead. His brothers anyway and his sisters. <clears throat> so 
So they come in with their words and they said in verse uh, 21, remember we already read it, his family heard about his growing popularity. They went out and that he was casting out demons to seize him saying he's out of his mind. He's crazy, right? He has demons essentially is what they were saying. His family's saying that. But since that didn't work, guess what? They come again. This is how relentless the devil is, guys. They come again. Look at this, verse 31. <clears throat> and his mother and his... <clears throat> Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Need some more tea. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. <sighs> Jesus is here sharing and setting people free, no doubt, from demons. And his family's outside, and they say, come out here, Jesus. Come out here. Come away from what you're doing. What are they trying to do? They're trying to pull him away from God's work. And what they're using is the family card. Do you get it? So they're coming, they're saying, we're your family. Nepotism, right? They're like, we're family members. You need to give us some preference. Come on, Jesus. We need some love. We're out here. And look, the guilt trips, right? You can feel the guilt trips. Where are you, Jesus? We need you, we need you to come out here. We just need to have a talk with you about who knows what, right? And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. So, I mean, they're, they're laying it on everybody else, too. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? Your own family's out here, and you're not even paying attention to them. Guess what Jesus says? You know what? I, I can see why Jesus wasn't very liked. He did not mess around. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Do you know how offensive that would have been for his family members, his blood family, to have heard? Half blood, I guess I should say. Do you know how offensive that would have been? He basically just, in front of everybody, publicly pretty much disowned his family. Jesus. And then he says... Here are my mother and brothers. As they're standing right there, he goes, Those are, that's not my family out there. This is my family right here. These who are listening to my teaching about what? Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. How many of you have ever heard someone ask the question, what is God's will for my life? And, and, and the question continues to get posed. What's God's will? I just don't know what God's will is for my life. Usually, um, when, when I was younger, I would ask that question. Thank you. What's God's will for my life? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Because God's put that innate question in us to seek out the answer to that question. What is God's will for my life? Wouldn't that be in the Sermon on the Mount? <clears throat> it's a good question. So, what is God's will for our life? To answer that question, Jesus says, whoever does the will of God. What was Jesus doing? He says, whoever does the will of God. Okay, Not whoever just knows theologically the will of God. Whoever does the will of God, these are my family members, my true family members. What was Jesus doing? What was the topic of his discussion? What is he talking to these people about? We just read what he was talking about. According to Jesus, what is doing the will of God? Casting out demons. What is God's will for your life? To cast out demons. How's that? <laughs> for a Sunday morning wake-up call. That's what he said. He says, those are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That's pretty intense, isn't it? How many people do you know who cast out demons? Christians. Jesus is saying they're not doing the will of God. They're not doing the work of God. But Jesus, guess what? Here's the flip side of that, of that coin, you know, that's hard to swallow. The flip side of that, Jesus says those who believe will do greater things because he was going to the Father. That means we don't have to do these things on our own. We have a helper that called the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I have done more deliverances. I have, in other words, cast out more demons than I can count. 
<clears throat> and I say that on purpose to let you know something. I'm going to follow it with another comment. I have never read one book on deliverance and casting out demons. Not one. Everything that I have learned about casting out demons, I have learned in the secret place with the Holy Spirit and actually doing it. I've never read a book on it. I wrote a book on it, but I've never done it. I've never read a book on it. And I didn't read a book on it before I wrote a book on it because I did not want what I was hearing from the Holy Spirit and reading in Scripture to be tainted by other men's ideas. Now, we, have, we get to learn from one another. That's my specific, like, God led me not to read books about it. I'm not saying you shouldn't read books about it. But the best way to learn is from the one who knows best about a topic, right? If I, if I work for, let's say I work for a Fortune 50 company, a massive, multi-billion dollar, multinational company, right? And the expert... The, the best expert on that company is probably the founder, right? And, and maybe, maybe they're the CEO as well. I don't know. Let's say the founder of that company who's been very successful, Fortune 50 company. Who would you rather learn from about how to operate that company and be successful? Someone who was um, just hired on? Or someone who's maybe mid-level management? Or would you rather learn from the founder himself? Who knows the topic of that business better than anybody? Who knows the, the business of this better than anybody of what we're talking about? Holy Spirit. God, God himself. But often we take a shortcut because it seems easier. And in the meantime, unfortunately, there's falsehood mixed into what we read and what we hear in podcasts, in books, etc. Okay? I'm just encouraging us all, go, go to the Lord. Go to Him. Soften your heart. You know, we don't go to the Lord sometimes because our heart has hardness in it. We're like, man, well, he, He's going to confront me on my stuff. And the Lord's like, no. I'm not going to just confront you on your stuff. I'm going to help you deal with your stuff. <laughs> And when we get free from that stuff in his presence because he loves us, he's there to help us, to teach us, and then empower us to do the will of God. This is the will of God. I understand that what I've talked about today is a hard word to hear. Have you, who, who, is here, who here has heard of the concept of cognitive dissonance? <clears throat> Can anybody tell me what cognitive dissonance is? Anybody? It's like, you know something to be true, but there's the evidence, so it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's, um, you're not seeing reality. Reality is not matching up with what's inside your head. And so there's a disconnect yeah. between what you think is real and what's actually real. The opposite. So cognitive dissonance is believing one thing and doing another. Exactly. In other words... If we come into a place <laughs> where we believe that what we're reading here in the Bible is actually true and doing the will of God is casting out demons, then guess what? We have to do something about that belief. That's, right. That's, right. That's why when I talk about this, this topic, and why when Jesus talked about the topic, the religious leaders and his family wanted to shut the topic down because they weren't doing it. And they didn't want to do it because it's easier not to do anything than it is to do something, right? Yeah. So cognitive dissonance is believing one thing, a.k.a. that it's not important to cast out demons, right? Or believing that it's important to cast out demons and then not doing it. You're going to be in turmoil, right? If you really believe that this is true, with, if you don't go do it, something about it, you're, you're going to be tormented, Right? You're going to be like, oh my goodness, I'm living a lie. So it's easier just to look away from the truth and not believe it and go, you know what, there's got to be some reason why that this is not actually, the translation's wrong, <laughs> or whatever the case is. We don't want to believe stuff, because if we believe it, that means that we have to do it. So it lacks integrity? Yeah. Dissonance is, is, um, is like even, it lacks integrity. 
lacks harmony. Music. It lacks harmony, exactly. You can't be harmonious or integrated when you've got one thing in Yes. You're going to have disharmony in your, in your soul, right? If you believe one thing and do something else. That's why people act out certain things because of beliefs they have. Like, if, if I believe that, you know what, the devil's not bothering me, I'm good to go, then I'm going to continue in my sin. And the devil, but if I go, you know what, the devil's keep, he's tempting me to do this stuff. And I believe that he's tempting me to do that. And the only way to get rid of him is to get rid of him. Then I'm going to get rid of him if I want to change. But if I don't really want to change, then I'm going to go on believing with my fingers in my ears going, la, 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 right? <laughs> How you guys doing? All right. So, um, if you love me, you will keep my commands, Jesus said. Mm. One of his commands in the Great Commission was go into all the world and teach them to observe or do everything that I taught you to the disciples. That's part of the Great Commission, is to do what Jesus did, right? So that's all I'm doing. I'm sharing and saying, let's do what Jesus told us to do. <laughs> and I've noticed on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, that when I shifted from talking about um, top, doing topical teachings, which I believe were 100% spirit-led, the topics anyway, I'm not saying everything I said was 100% spirit-led, um, but I believe the topics were week to week. We saw manifestations and, and, and confirmations of that. Nevertheless, I think the Lord is, is calling us to a higher standard. It's like he, he does things in seasons to prepare us for something greater. But I've noticed that as soon as we got started talking about the topic of Jesus, about the man Jesus himself, views went way down. <laughs> Why? cognitive dissonance. People do not want to look at such a high standard because that means that they would have to change. So what are we left with? We're left with options. As, we start, as I started with, we're left with options. What can we do? Option A, ignore. We can simply look the other way and, in, and inevitably partner with the devil Passively, We can passively partner with the devil, not even know it, by simply ignoring these truths of what God has commanded us, told us to do. Man, to resist God is witchcraft. It's Christian witchcraft. Rebellion as is the sin of witchcraft, which is what Saul was involved in, King Saul. That's why Saul behaved the way he did, because he has resisted the Holy Spirit. That's why God sit and he had bitterness in his heart against David. That's why God, it says, do you notice what it said? God sent him a tormenting spirit. I don't want it, God to send me any tormenting spirits, much less invite them myself. So option A is we can ignore this whole topic and just, you know what, I'm going to go back to my life. I'm going to go back to the comfort of my couch, watching my favorite TV show and binge watching movies. I can go back to drinking alcohol when I go through a difficult time. I can do drugs. I can call a friend and we can chat and just spend tons of time together. All while Jesus sits there and waits for a relationship. And says, I have everything. I have the keys of the kingdom. But guess what? I'm not the only one who has them. I've given them to you. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what you release on earth will be released in heaven. That's what he said. He's given us keys to the kingdom. So option A, we can live in ignorance and go back and willingly say, you know what? I don't want to look at this stuff because it's too hard because it means I'd have to get off my butt and do something. <laughs> Sorry to be frank, guys. This is a serious hour that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. The days are not getting brighter. They're getting darker on this earth. But the light does shine brighter in darkness. And we know who wins these battles. And we are on the winning side. 
But while I'm on the winning side, I, I don't want to go in the opposite direction and sc score uh, points for the opposite team. It's like playing basketball and running in the opposite direction and dunking it and wondering why no one's cheering because you just scored for the wrong team. <laughs> oh, duh, right? So being in ignorance is essentially just living our life, even as Christians, scoring for the devil's team. Option B is we can give up. I, I, um, I always appreciate when people are transparent with me, when people are forthright, right? I'm going to be real with you guys. I was very discouraged today. I have never been so discouraged on a Sunday morning as I was this morning. I did not want to come. I could barely study. And I, and, I, and I drug my feet, and I drug my feet to the last minute, not even wanting to look at the Bible this morning. Not because I don't love the Lord or love the Bible, but because I was so discouraged in my heart because of what I've seen happen this week, what the devil has done in people's lives, and it breaks my heart. And, and I had a choice. I could give up. My wife wasn't able to be here because of laryngitis. I, I love it when my wife's here. I feel supported when she's here. She's not here today. And, and so that was my, I had to make that choice this morning. Am I going to just give up? Am I just going to go up there and just give some vanilla mamsy pamsy things that people want to hear? Am I just going to tell them what they want to hear? I said, I, Lord, I'm like, Lord, I don't even want to teach on this topic. Why, why this topic? Like, I want to talk about a, a bunch of other stuff today, but not this. But here it is. Am I going to resist and rebel against the Lord, am I, or am I going to be obedient? And, and, of course, it occurred to me, which it always does eventually, you know what? I wonder if the reason why I'm so discouraged this morning is because there's going to be a massive breakthrough for people today. And the devil's angry at me because he knows that I obey the Lord and he's seen the pattern of my life and I'm not going to shy back and I'm not going to shrink back as so many do from the truth, even when they're discouraged. Amen. Battle is not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be hard. And I am not sharing these things at all in anger, guys. I am sharing them with passion to encourage you to do things that we all get to do, but so often don't. Yeah. Not, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In a moment, it's so simple. We can say, you know, what, Lord, I repent of not doing these things. I repent of not resisting the devil in my own life. I, re I repent of it. I'm just going to start with my own life, Lord. And you know what I had to do this morning? I had to repent. I just say, Lord, I should not be discouraged. And I think what's happening in my mind right now is I'm a, as I'm assigning things to you that you're not doing to me. This is the devil. I shouldn't be disappointed, Lord. If I'm disappointed, it's because I'm disappointed in him. And that's garbage. That's false. That's a lie. Amen. And we have to resist it every single day. So we can give up. And when we give up, we partner with the devil. You know what? When I'm sitting, when I stay in a place of discouragement, I'm basically saying, Lord, you're not big enough to help me. You're not strong enough to help me. And I have no faith in that moment. Or option C, I can say, you know what? I've done wrong, Lord. I've been discouraged and I shouldn't have been, but I can change in a moment. Amen. In a moment, I failed again. Whatever it is for you in your life, there's many in here who have said to themselves, I failed, I failed again. I fell again. And the Lord says to you, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Amen. Don't try to fake it. Admit that you're weak. And when you admit that you're weak, you get his strength. When you fake and pretend that you're strong, you get leveled. You know why? Because you're doing it on your own. You're not asking for help. You know that there is the, 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 the smallest, most insignificant, low-ranking demon on this earth will take you out. 
will take me out if I'm not partnering with God. They have been around a lot longer than we have. The insights and the level of discernment that we need to fight the devil can only come from God, I'm telling you. They've been around for thousands of years. They know way more than we do. They're, they're very, very strategic. They are not idiots, okay? If you think they're an idiot, they're idiots, you're, okay, being blind. I'll just say that. Or I'm being blind to the reality. But when we understand our foe, but also remember our father, Amen. we remember that even though I'm small in comp comparison to Goliath, God is way bigger than Goliath. Amen. And David understood that. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Right. To David, Goliath wasn't big, he was tiny. <clears throat> to Saul, Goliath was big. Fear had gripped Saul. He was afraid of Goliath. Why? Because he had resisted the only help that he had, and that is the Lord God Almighty. David had a surrendered, humble heart, and he killed lions and bears, and then he took down a big giant that no one else would touch. So no matter how short or weak David was, he took down the biggest giant in the land. The Lord gave me the name of a principality just about a week and a half ago that's been operating this area. And I, and I heard the name of it, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, wrong. And I'm not afraid to say the name of it, because I'm not afraid of demons. I'm not afraid of principalities. The name is Raquel, and I'm probably saying it wrong. I heard the name as I'm, as I'm warring in the spirit with my friend Jay, and I thought, man, that's like a woman's name. What is that? So I researched it. You can research it on your own. It's one of the, one of the fallen angels that's over, over one of the five uh, kingdoms of darkness. Okay? And it is operating in this area, and it particularly operates in, in false shepherding, Judaism, in other words, encouraging people to give themselves over to doing a bunch of religious things rather than giving in and, and, and trusting in the grace of God, that thing is operating in this area. And there's many other things that it operates in, okay? And he told me as I heard that, I was like, wow. I'm like, I don't, I'm just waiting. Like, how, what am I supposed to do about this new knowledge that I have? It, it also operates in, the, uh, I believe, the Pestifer kingdom, which is, has to do with things of the earth, like um, drugs and things like that. Um, so as I'm, as I'm just waiting on the Lord, you know what he said to me? He goes, you have authority over that. Amen. And so I began to war against the thing and I declared, I said, your power in this area is diminishing. Your influence in this area is diminishing. And I believe that it is. And I believe that's one of the reasons why I'm getting hit so hard by the enemies because I'm coming against a principality. But it's because he told me I have authority over it. And so I would ask and invite any of you as you feel led to pray for me, to partner with me if you are led to do that same thing. This is no small task. This, is, this thing is over um, an entire kingdom of darkness, but it means nothing compared to the strength and the might of the God who created that being. Right. Some, some gentleman, I almost want to call him a fool. I can't even believe it. He wrote this book years ago about being careful, be careful not to come against certain demons because man, they'll, they'll come get your family and they'll, you'll really pay the price. Whoa. Garbage, man. That is anti, that is demonic. Whoever says that kind of stuff, it's absolutely demonic from the devil. It's the devil saying the same thing he said here through these men and through these family members in Mark chapter 3. Don't do this. Don't bind the strong man. Don't deal with the devil. You should be afraid. Be careful. You're going to get retaliated on. Not if I tell the devil not to retaliate against me because I have authority over him. If I say you can't retaliate against me, for what I just did to you, then he can't, because I told him not to. <laughs> it's that simple. <coughs> guys, guys, we have power over all the power of the enemy. The enemy has zero authority. We have all authority. Again, 
I know I have taught on this topic many times in the past, and yet the Lord is on it again. Why do you think that is? We need to do it. Urgency. Urgency. And I know that when I talk about this, there will be people who will say, you're crazy. This guy's crazy. I don't care. If it's what he's about, because Jesus did it day in and day out, it's what I'm going to be about. So we are going to be having spiritual warfare training. I don't know when. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like but I'm excited for it because this is what the church needs. This is what the church needs. People are wandering around not knowing how to do this stuff. And they, even if they believe they should, they feel cognitive dissonance that they're not. They're feeling discouraged. So be praying into that if you guys would. What that's supposed to look like. I have some ideas about it, but I haven't been given liberty to share what those ideas are quite yet. Um, but I know it's coming. And I know that the devil is going to work to do everything he can to keep that from happening. But it will not work. He will be disappointed with his efforts. And the Lord will get the glory for what we're going to do. Amen? Amen? And I didn't say what I'm going to do. What we are going to do together as, as a battalion, as an army not of one, but of many. And not just at spirit and truth, but across this city. Amen. And God is calling people from other areas to move here to Grants Pass for this work. Why? Because there is a revival that's going to spread the nation that's going to be based out of Grants Pass. Amen. That's not just what I'm saying because I live here. When I first moved, when we first moved to Grants Pass, before we knew anyone in this town, we didn't know a single prophet or pastor or a, a single person whatsoever. The only people we knew were the people we moved with from Medford to, to come here. Okay, and in the secret place, as I'm praying, the Lord told me there is going to be revival out of Grants Pass that will change the nation. That will that I don't know about change the nation, but it will it will start here and it will spread through the nation. Yeah. To some degree. And then after maybe a few years of being here, a few years later, I shared that with some people. Other prophets and believers who have heard the same exact thing. So the Lord is doing something strategic in this city and he is calling people who don't live here to come here. We are calling to people that we do not know, Isaiah 55 verse 5. And they are coming. <laughs> Because there are many here who are unwilling to take up the sword, to enter into the fight. And so he's bringing warriors into the area. And it's happening. We are in a season of building. He is building a battalion. He is building a battalion. Do you, do you feel the Holy Spirit on that? He is building it. And the enemy knows what's happening as he is getting frantic. Because he knows if the truth gets out to too many people, that they, too many Christians, let me be specific, that they have authority and that this is the command of Jesus to do these things. He is in trouble. As it stands now, he's, uh, he's doing well. Because not enough people are doing something about him. But that's going to be changing. That's right. <laughs> I'm going to read it one more time. Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother, a.k.a. whoever casts out demons, sets people free from the kingdom of darkness, and shares the good news, healing people, etc. These things that Jesus did, we are the ones who have that fellowship of his sufferings, his, the communion with him, the intimacy. That's why when you talk to some people about this and their eyes glaze over and they don't understand what you're talking about, it's because there's a la either a lack of maturity in their life or a lack of intimacy in the secret place with him. Because when you know him, 
you just read the words on the page and they make sense. If you don't know him, you read these words and you run the other way or you, or you get distracted with thoughts in your mind that the enemy puts there without resisting them and pushing them out. So guys, I am, I am excited about what the Lord is doing. I am thankful and I give him praise for what he's done in my own heart today to strengthen me as I simply have just walked in and obeyed. There's a testimony for you guys this morning. Next time you get discouraged, just do what he says to do and you won't be discouraged anymore. In fact, when you get discouraged, when you feel what I felt this morning or something similar, do you know what it means? It means that you are very close to a breakthrough. The enemy doesn't want you to push through. It means there's something even bigger than you've been used to. The bigger the resistance, the bigger the breakthrough that's coming. The bigger the resistance, the more God's glory is going to be shown. And the enemy doesn't want that. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, at the end here, I want to... We, we almost always do this as spirit-led, I would, I would say, but... There are no doubt potentially people in this room who want to, they want something. Are you here today and you want something from the Lord? Are you here today and you know you need something from the Lord? And you're not okay with the cognitive dissonance anymore. You're not okay with believing something and doing something different. If that's you today, I have some anointing oil and I believe that the Lord wants to help impart to you, to us, an extra measure of encouragement. It's in the word. In courage. Discourage. Not encourage. Versus in courage. 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 To take what the enemy, take back what the enemy has stolen. We dwell so often in the strong man's house and God is calling us to take that house for the kingdom, to take that place or that soul for the kingdom. So I'm going to put some music on. If someone would go in the back and just turn the first two front bay of lights off, it's, a, it's the first two switches toward the front of the building. Um, I'm going to put some music on and if you would like to be anointed to have more courage, I will anoint you, but it's the Holy Spirit that's going to be anointing you. He's going to be anointing you. We need his anointing. It's his anointing that breaks the yoke. Amen. Oil speaks of what? Anointing. Everything in the spirit is acts of faith, right? right. So we're going, to, we're going to take an act of faith today. If you, if you want to have more courage when you are discouraged, out of courage... I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to impart to you extra courage today. And does that mean that things are going to be easy? Hear me loud and clear. Things are going to be harder. I want you to know that. If you come up here and receive an anointing, the devil's going to come harder at you this week. So just know what you're signing up for, guys. But you will have the courage to come against him. But it's going to require a shift in your mindset it's going to require a shift in your behavior. When he comes with whatever he's used to getting you with, okay, you know what it is. Think about it for a second. I know you don't want to. What does the devil usually get you with? Just think about it. You don't have to say it, but you know what it is, don't you? That, th that one or two or three things where he just hooks you in time after time after time. We're going to come against that today. Very targeted, laser targeted like a sniper rifle against that thing that he comes against in your life. But know that he's going to hit you. The devil's going to hit you pretty hard this week. And you know, some of that is allowed by the Lord. Do yeah. you know that? Yeah. To make you a warrior. Yeah. Is it going to be painful? Yep. Yeah. So in other words, who wants to sign up to um, enroll in the military? That's what, that's what we're doing today. If you want to enroll in the military... Um, if you want to take bullets from the devil, but you, if you also want to take territory, and you might fail all week long, okay? 
but you're going to have an anointing, and there's going to, we're going to declare today that that's going to shift at some point. Don't get discouraged. Soldiers fall down, guys. If there, if there was no battle, you wouldn't get discouraged. It's because there's a battle. And the, the devil knows the authority. He knows your unique giftings. He knows what you bring to the people on this earth. He knows that it's special and unique, and he made you to break chains off of demonic captives. He knows that you can set yourself free with your own words. And when the devil comes against you and the demons come against you the hardest, that's your opportunity to come against him even harder. But you can never do it on your own. You have to reach out. You have to humble yourself. You have to repent. And you got to do it quickly. The moment you fall, don't just... Sit there and believe the lie that it'll just go away with time. Oh, maybe I'll feel better if I just kind of sleep on it and wait till tomorrow. No, you repent right then. You resist the devil right then. You say, thank you, Yeshua, for your blood that washes away all my sin. Thank you, Lord, that if I, when I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive me of all my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And when you do that and receive his forgiveness, you're going to get fired up. And you're going to want to take territory and you're going to go to battle for your brothers and sisters. You're going to pray through the night. <sighs> and when the devil wakes you up in the middle of the night with temptation or, or discouragement, guess what you're going to do? You're not going to go back to sleep. You're going to wake up and you're going to say to your soul, wake up, soul, I'm a warrior. And I'm going to take it back to you, devil. Devil. With what you've brought to me, I know my brothers and sisters out there are dealing with the same stuff even right now, so I'm going to pray for them. Amen. Enough is enough. Right. He doesn't get to have any more territory, the devil. Right. <sighs> Three options. Ignore, give up, or fight back. A, B, or C. C, option C stands for courage. Yes. 